So on behalf of our executive director, Pete Ramirez, uh, just want to give greetings to you here at Mandarin Baptist Church of San Fernando Valley. Uh, we are uh, really a, a network of 2,400 churches here in Southern California. And we minister uh, to the 40 million people who call California home. But at the same time as we minister to uh, our state, we realize that California is really the largest mission field in North America. Amen. There's roughly 34 million people who do not know the Lord. Now, if you take that into consideration, if you take the entire population of the state of Texas, we would still have more lostness, more people who are lost in California than the entire state of Texas. That tells you kind of the vast lostness that we have in this state. Now, our executive director, he has this vision that in 2033, what do you think is significant about 2033? Jesus lived 33 years. Woo! 2033 will be 2,000 years, right? Since Jesus established the church, and he wants by 2033, to reach 2% of California. 2% of California roughly with the demographics will be 900,000 people to come to, to know the Lord. And you ask yourself, how is that possible? This is California. <laughs> Do you know our governor? <laughs> the policies? How is that possible? Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that we have a God who makes the impossible possible. When, we've at, when we had revival um, in our country, whether it's the Great Awakenings or the Jesus Movement, roughly 10 to 15% of the population came to know the Lord. But only God can do that. And we have a God who makes the impossible possible. And that's what I want to talk about today, making the impossible possible. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, we have this triad. I like to call this triad the triad of impossibility, because there's nothing but absolutes in this triad. The Apostle Paul writes this, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in all things give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You read that, and personally, I want to skim it over and say, yeah, okay, that, that sounds good. But when I read the absolutes, I think to myself, impossible. But if you recall, when I was here last time, I spoke on the topic of praying unceasingly and how we can do it because of Christ and how we need to do it because we seek and we need God's presence every moment of every day. Today, I want to talk about that first phrase, rejoice always. I want to tackle that, but tackle it in a very specific situation. And that specific situation is one of trials, tribulations, and suffering. So today, the title of my sermon is Making the Impossible Possible rejoicing in suffering. But before I continue, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, but lift up our hearts to heaven. Father, we come before you because, Lord, you are so good. We come before you, Father, because you love us. We come before you, Father, because you alone are worthy of all praise, of all glory. And so, Father, as we come before you, we ask, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so when we, so like the angels and the saints in heaven who worship you without end, I pray, Father, that we here would get a glimmer of what that would look like here on earth. 
that you would be pleased by our acts of worship today. That it's not about a performance. It's not because this is what we do every week. But truly, Father, it is because we love you, because we want to exalt your name, because we want to proclaim the good God who saved us, the good God who continues to say, sustain us. And Father, we want to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are lost, the 34 million who are our neighbors here in California. But we know, Father, that we can't do this by ourselves. We can only do it through you. And so, Father, this day, we ask, Lord, for your presence, your presence to comfort us, your presence to empower us, your presence, Father, to help us as we worship you this day. We thank you, Father. Thank you for the God that you are. Thank you for loving us so much that you would choose people like us to come to faith, to reconnect to you, to be able be, to be loved by you, and now to share that love to the lost. So we thank you, Father. In all this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So I've got six kids, and you know, when you have kids, you're basically an unpaid Uber, right? And so you're driving around, and you know, one of these days, one of my kids does gymnastics, and so I'm waiting for her, and they always get out late. Because you know what, you know, when, when, when you're, they're on, when you're late, they, they always get out early, like once a year. So I'm always there, I'm like, all right, I'm trying to be on time just in case. And typically when I'm there and it goes long, I'm, I'm on my phone, I'm kind of scrolling through social media. And, and one day I was doing this and all of a sudden I, there was a, there, there was a question that kind of piqued my interest. And it was this, what advice were you given that you initially thought was kind of crazy or didn't make sense, but later on in life, you thought, hmm, Maybe there is some merit to that. And so one of the answers came from um, uh, this 20-year-old. And at 13, her grandmother had given her this advice. And the advice was this. In life, you're either entering a hardship, you're in the midst of a hardship, or you're just exiting a hardship. <laughs> she was horrified. She's like, dude, grandma. You know, be a little bit more optimistic. You know, but later on in life, she realized, hmm, grandma was right. Now, I don't necessarily believe this perspective, right? There are times of happiness, but as it tells us in Ecclesiastes, also there's times, right, of sadness, of difficulty. And so that's just part of life. Uh, Dr. Jeff Forge, who uh, just stepped down as the president of uh, Gateway Seminary, um, he likes to say in life, there's losses, right? And that's how he defines hardships. Loss of a job, loss of a relationship, loss of health, loss of loved ones, loss of a dream. Lostness is it's a normal part of life. In Ecclesiastes, again, it tells us that there's a time for all things. But how are we as believers to respond to times of lostness? Our response is actually quite surprising. If you have your Bibles with me, or if you have your phones or other electronic device, would you turn with me? to our, pa our other passage today. James chapter one, verses two through six. James chapter one, verses two through six. So what's up there is the English standard version. I have the new American. <coughs> so you know what I'll do is I'll actually read from the English standard that's up there. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. 
For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts it's like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Typically, when we look at the passage, one of the key kind of uh, components of, of studying the Bible is you, you, you look for commands, right? What is the Bible telling you to do? And in verse 2, there is a command. And in the ESV, it's count. In uh, the New American Standard, it's consider. All right. So what are we to do? We're to count it all joy. Not some joy. Not when you feel like it. But it says to count it all joy. When? When you meet trials of various kinds, it tells us. Man, this is so counterintuitive, <laughs> isn't it? Thank you, Lord, for my times of difficulty, for my times of suffering. Thank you, Lord, when I've lost my job. Thank you, Lord, when I've lost my health. Thank you, Lord, when I'm caring for a loved one that's sick. Thank you, Lord. And the list goes on and on and on. Pastor Bill Eliff, who wrote the manual on prayer called Prayer with No Intermission, 40 Days to Unceasing Prayer, he writes this. Obviously, this is the exact opposite of my normal response. In, re in response to verse 2 here, he writes, Obviously, this is the exact opposite of my normal response. I consider it all anguish or consider it all a burden or consider it something I want to get rid of or solve quickly and on to life. But this is life. End quote. Brothers and sisters, it isn't rejoicing for the sake of rejoicing. This passage is not telling us just, just to rejoice. It's not saying, hey, be a masochist, enjoy the pain. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying ignore your emotions, that it doesn't hurt, that, that you want to weep, that all you need to do is grit your teeth and bear through these trials. That's not what this passage is saying. What it's saying is when trial comes, when you suffer loss, yes, weep. Yes, mourn. Now you're asking, Pastor, isn't that just contradictory and co conflicting to what you just said in this passage is, is, is telling us? Didn't you just say, Pastor, rejoice? Let me explain it in, in this way. I had the privilege of uh, having um, a good friend in the church I pastored many years ago. This good friend was 50 years older than myself. I called him Dr. Mac. He was a doctor of uh, Chinese medicine, right? What was interesting is that he spoke very little English. I would say he spoke none whatsoever. And if anyone has heard me speak Chinese, I really don't speak Chinese either, <laughs> right? But we became fast friends, right? And, um, you know, we were really bound by the gospel and the love of Christ, and we love good Cantonese food. Those are two things that, that bound us together. And so every so often, we would just bump into each other at, at, at restaurants, right? And, and he became just a good friend of mine, uh, a good brother in Christ. During some of the most difficult times in my ministry, all he needed to do was lay his hand on my shoulder, and he would say, eat another spoonful of rice, 
in, in, in Chinese. <laughs> Just short of his 100th birthday, he, he passed away. And we were, we were celebrating, um, uh, we were planning to celebrate his birthday. And I was privileged at his funeral to be able to kind of share what our relationship was, was like. And in the midst of the weeping and in the midst of the tears, there was tremendous joy. Because now he would be reunited with his wife who had passed five years earlier. She had dementia and different health issues. And he had cared for her. And in his last days, he was suffering. And so even though there was sadness in his leaving, there was still joy. And so you can have both. There is no conflict. So you can rejoice while simultaneously mourning. But verse 2 tells us why and how this takes place. Right? Verse, verse 3, the next verse. It says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, the reason why we can rejoice in the midst of suffering, firstly, is because there is a meaningful purpose to the test. So for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I mean, you, you can go to the next verse as well. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. There's a meaningful purpose to what you're going through. God has a plan for your trial, and that is to pre prepare you for the future. So you won't lack for anything, this passage tells us. It, it could be to handle a future opportunity. It could be to walk with a brother or a sister, a fellow believer who will be suffering through the same thing that you just went through. But you can't and will not learn that lesson until you walk through the trial. I'll give you an example from an illustration from the business world. In the 90s, all right, this is, let me ask, you guys might know this answer. What was the number one cell phone maker in the 90s? Nextel. Nokia. Nokia. Oh, so close. Motorola. Motorola. He had a StarTAC, just like me. Motorola was the number, like, they were the biggest deal, right? In the 90s, AT&T went to Motorola and said, hey, switch from analog to di digital. Motorola said, there's no way. We're like the number one you know, manufacturer and seller of, of the analog phones, and the voice quality is terrible. We're not going to do it, right? And so AT&T went to Nokia. And Nokia said, hey, we'll do it. The rest is history. Who owns a Motorola phone now? <laughs> right? Some 20 years later, no one owns it. At the time, the head of Motorola's uh, division uh, for innovation uh, was a gal uh, by the name of Julie Scheimer. Uh, she saw the precipitous decline and fall because they refused to innovate. In 2007, she became the company, uh, the CEO of a, a pharmaceutical, uh, a medical company that, that created diagnostic equipment. And she, this firm also was leading in its field, number one in its field. But because of what she learned at her time of Motorola, she said we had to innovate. And so they innovated to such an extent that really she became one of the most successful CEOs uh, of her time from 2007 to 2012. And she recognized, she said, if I did not go through that hardship and pain learning in Motorola, I would not have made the same decision that I made in, in, her, in the new firm that she was in, Welch Allen. 
In the same way, brothers and sisters, unless we walk through the trial and learn the lessons that only the trial can teach us, we will not, as this passage tells us, be perfect and complete. We will lack for nothing only if we go through this trial that God has ordained and allowed us to walk through. But what we must do in the ESV it says steadfastness. In the New American, it says to endure. Again, Dr. Bill Elif, endurance is faith stretched out. It is faith that has been so tested that it is able to go to the finish line. It is the faith that I will need to meet future tasks and trials. Without this test, I will be ill-equipped to face the next challenge. God knows and is preparing me. Endurance will give me the calmness that is able to entrust any burden to God. And the greatest endurance of that faith is joy. He writes, and I want to emphasize this, God knows and is preparing me. But brothers and sisters, the trial that you're walking through, God knows and is also preparing you. So we can rejoice, brothers and sisters, because there is a meaningful purpose to our trial. It's not random. It's not fate. God has allowed and ordained it to take place. So when we face trials, let us determine. Let this purpose that you have in store for us be fulfilled. Let this trial complete the work that's intended for me. It will build my faith like nothing else can. And in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain, I can rejoice because there is a meaningful purpose for this trial. But what's more important? This is the promise that God has for us, right? In, in verses three and four. This is the promise. What's more important, the promise or the person making the promise? Right, this year is election season. You all know about promises. <laughs> promises may be great, and like this one, it might sound like, wow, I can buy into this. For me, it really depends on who the promise maker is. Who is it that makes this promise? Who is it that has allowed this trial to take place. In verse 3, it tells us, right, there's that word knowing, knowing that you have this purpose. Now, this, this knowing is more than just knowing facts. This knowing is relational. It is knowing the promise maker. It's knowing the God who has made this promise, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of the Bible, and our God. And each of us has our own story, our own spiritual journey, how God broke into our lives to pick us up from the mire and the muck of sin, even though he didn't have to, to save us. I'd like to share my story, my family's story, in fact. My uncle is here, so I'm glad he's here, because this is our story. We have this book in our family. It was just updated, actually, this past year. It is a book that records the genealogy on my father's side of the family. It records 122 generations of Chungs. 
122 generations. The first entry, 1150 BC. 3,000 years of history. What I read in this book is a book of God's faithfulness. 119 years of lostness, 119 generations of lostness. Almost 3,000 years of lostness is recorded in this book. And this is kind of, kind of the show and tell. This is kind of the updated uh, version of the book here. But in this book, what you see is 119 generations of lostness before God said, let me break into the life of this family. Let Christ and the gospel break into this line of lostness so that there would be life. The gospel that's so simple to articulate, but so incredible, right? The gospel that says that God created the heavens and earth, God created men to relate to him in a very personal and intimate way, but we thought we knew better. In fact, man said, we don't need you, God. Let's remove these shackles. But what we didn't realize is when we remove these, sh what we thought were shackles, they're a lifeline to life and hope and power and peace. And we rejected God And God said, if that's what you want. And in our lostness, we could not go back to God. There is nothing that we could do that would, that would cover our sin, wash it away. So again, the theme, God makes the impossible possible, right? What we could not do, God did by sending his son, Jesus Christ. The God-man who lived a sinless life, the one born of a babe, born of a virgin as a babe, to live the life that we live so he understood what it means to live, born a man so that a man could redeem a man, but, born, but God as well so that he could redeem humanity. And when he died on that cross, my sins and that burden was born on him. And he rose again on the third day, and the tomb was empty as we celebrated in Easter not too long ago. And when I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, then this sinful man was restored back to a heavenly and holy God. That happened in the 120th generation of my family. My uncle Edward is in the 120th generation. So of that generation of our family. God didn't forget us. He's that kind of God. Now that's the God who just made this promise. That's the God who says, rejoice when you suffer trials. Rejoice because I have a purpose for that trial. I have a purpose for that suffering. I will prepare you for what's coming. And only through going through this trial, only through going through the fire, through the crucible, Will you be prepared? Brothers and sisters, we can rejoice because a good and caring God allows trials for our benefit. But then, you know, quite often as, 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 as preachers, and, and, and I check my, my sermons on this all the time, and, you know, we... we let me summarize basically all my applications like this in, in essence of 20 years of ministry. Basically, my applications are this. Do more, try harder. 
right? There's some that they do more and try harder. But rejoice in trials, Pastor? Really? I, I'm not strong enough, Pastor. It doesn't even make sense to me, Pastor. I mean, this, this sounds cool. Yes, God who saved us wants us to rejoice. There's a benefit to it. There's, there's a plan. There's a meaningful purpose to it. But, all right, this is real life. How is this possible, Pastor? And what I'm trying to tell, it, tell you is it's not about you. You can't do it. But what you can't do, God can. Bring up that slide for, for the passage again. What does it say in verses 5 and 6? It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, basically lacks the ability, not just cognitive, but the ability to take verses 2 and 3 and apply it in your lives, which is me, which is everyone here. I'm just telling you right now, right? If any of you lacks wisdom to apply what we just read, let him ask God. Let him ask God, it tells us. And there's, there's the second command here. Let him ask God. He's saying, pray to God. Why do you pray to God? I already told you, this is the God who saved you. This is the great God who, who loves you, who cares for you, has benefit you, for you. But it also says, let him ask God who gives generously. This is the God who is generous, who wants to answer your prayers, who will answer your prayers, who's waiting for you to pray, in fact. Let me read Isaiah chapter 30, verses 18 through 19. He, the prophet Isaiah writes, Therefore the Lord longs, he longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. He's longing, he's waiting, for the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. And in verse 19, For you people in Zion, inhabitants in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will certainly be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. I'm not trying to tell you do more, try harder, because you're already doing a lot. You're already trying. Now, what I'm telling you to do is to cry out to God and let him give you the strength and the grace to handle what you cannot handle yourself. And so this passage tells us, ask God. And he'll give it to you. But there's a condition. Verse 6, if you can have that slide back up. Verse 6. What's that condition? That condition is quite simply this, right? You're to ask in faith. You know what that is? It's trusting God. Trusting in God to do what he says he prom that what he will promise And that's how you're to ask and there's the third command here ask ask in faith not just pray now pray with trust in God Think about your spiritual journey. How can you not trust this God? Who has never left you who has always been with you, who even now walks with you, supporting you, carrying you, who longs, it tells us in Isaiah, who waits for you, who when he hears your cry will answer. Sometimes 
but sometimes we don't have faith. For one reason or another, we, we, we don't. I want to read this passage in, in Mark 6. In Mark 6, it talks about, it describes a scene where Jesus goes home. He goes to Nazareth. And I want to read this for you because this is, I love this passage because it tells us something that made Jesus in awe. It tells us, and just listen, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, being Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. In verses 1 and 2, we hear that the people were astonished. Right? They were amazed at what Jesus did. But, verse 3, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do, do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few people and healed them. Verse 6. In the New American it says, And he wondered. Other translations. And he was at awe at their unbelief. What makes Jesus awestruck? <coughs> that we don't trust in him. How do we know we don't trust in him? We don't pray. How do you know you don't trust in him? When we don't rejoice at all times. And when we don't rejoice during times of trials. Because, brothers and sisters, it's not about doing more. It's about giving it to the Lord and allowing the Lord to provide that joy that you cannot produce on your own. That's the evidence of our faith. And so, brothers and sisters, I think it's appropriate for us to end this time and to end it with prayer. And let me ask this before, before you bow your heads and, and your hearts. Are there any of you going through a trial today? If so, would you stand so we could pray for you? Would you stand in the midst of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Would you stand if you need prayer? If there is no joy because it's too hard, would you stand because you want your other brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you, to know that you're struggling? Would you stand if you need prayer? Brothers and sisters, let's bow our heads and our hearts. Oh God, you're the God who is faithful. You're the God who sustains us. And you promise us, you promise us that if we cry out to you, you will answer. You will answer our cry to you. And you will respond 
with compassion and grace. And so, Father, I pray for those standing today as they go through their trials and suffering. Lord, we lift them up to you because, Father, they're at the end of their rope. They can't strive any longer. They have no strength left in them. They're emotionally drained. And so, Father, would you fill them? Would you be their hope? Would you be their joy? So that in the midst of their suffering, after they face this trial, your presence would be with them intimately. They would feel your hand of mercy, that they would have the peace that passes all understanding, that they would have a joy that's complete. And so as they face these times, they can rejoice because they have Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, because truly you are enough. In all this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.